Greetings, everyone. This is Canadian Meets the South, episode 15. Today, I'll be reviewing James McPherson's book, Jefferson Davis, Embattled Rebel. Now, first thing um, that James McPherson says was his introduction. He said quite clearly that he was a Union man. His sympathies lay with Lincoln and the North. And obviously he, he believes that slavery is wrong. But because of that, it wouldn't be fair for him to make a book about Jefferson Davis and constantly compare him to Lincoln, which often the two of them are compared. He tries to evaluate Jefferson Davis on his own merits. Now, he, he go uh, well, as president. He doesn't really talk about Davis's relationship with President Zachary Taylor too much, or really much of his early life. It's it's really focused on Davis's presidency. But um, when the first convention among the first seven states was called, Davis hoped to be sent uh, to be chosen by the delegates as as general in chief of the army the confederate army but instead he was chosen as president well provisional president first and then of course later permanent president under the permanent constitution but um he was first the provisional president in 1861 to 1862. And he wasn't exactly happy. He wanted to do the fighting himself. He, after all, he was a soldier. And soldier for involved in more than one war. He was involved in the Black Hawk War, I believe, in 1835. And later, he got involved in the Mexican-American War, in which um, he rekindles his relationship with General Zachary Taylor. See, he was Zachary Taylor's former son-in-law at that time. In, 30, in 1835, so he he married his first wife, uh, Sarah Knox Taylor, and it lasted for three months because they both contracted malaria and Sarah had died, and it was. Not a very happy time for Zachary Taylor, obviously. And you could say he maybe... Well, I, I don't want to say something wrong, but it seemed like he was not happy with Jefferson Davis after that. But um, during one of the battles, I don't know if it was the Battle of Buena Vista or... It was one of the battles during the Mexican-American War in which uh, Davis did something heroic while fighting under Taylor. And then Taylor had said, Sir, I have misjudged you. My daughter was... It seems my daughter was a better judge of, of character of a man than I ever was. And their their relationship got better. And even though 
Taylor became the Whig president, a uh, presidential candidate, and eventually wins the election of 1848. Uh, Davis didn't actually support Taylor, despite loving him, because his, like, uh, he said in his book, The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Taylor's advisors were all Whigs, and they would listen to him, and he would he would surely listen to them more than than to Davis, but they still maintained a very good relationship. He, uh, Taylor still treated him very well, as like a like a son, even, and and invited him and his second wife, Irina, to, you know, socials before Taylor eventually dies. But well, that's, that's enough about Zachary Taylor. This book was about Davis's presidency. Um, I guess you can say Toombs, Robert Toombs was kind of jealous of Davis. But Davis was selected because he had both military experience and political experience. Before the Mexican-American War, he, he first, I believe, served in the House of Representatives. And then afterwards, he was a senator. Uh, I could be wrong about that. And certainly he was against the Compromise of 1850 as a friend of John C. Calhoun. And, you know, he chaired the famous Committee of 13 in 1861, which, uh, in 1860 to 61, which it was, which voted on whether or not to extend the Missouri Compromise line to the Pacific. This was, this was called the Crittenden Compromise. But Lincoln had told the Republicans on the committee that uh, they shouldn't compromise at all. And so there were five, commit five Rep Republicans, eight Democrats, and because all, the, all five Democrats had voted against it, Davis and Toombs switched their vote to vote against it because they wanted a majority of both parties to pass the compromise if if any if we, they were going to get somewhere. Other otherwise, if it was just voted before by Democrats, it wouldn't. Uh, there would still be sectional strife. But um, after, you know, not long after the Committee of 13 had failed, Mississippi and the other states had uh, left the Union. And he was, and eventually, after, the con when the Constitution was uh, the provisional constitution was drafted and Davis was so elected he had to form his own cabinet and there were six positions on the cabinet right and he as president would be the seventh person I guess and it was kind of political what he did what he would choose one person from each state so that each state each of the seven states would have representation in the in the in the cabinet which i don't know if i like that but that's it's kind of political that's of how what what he did and then what i found interesting was that i think his name was Mallory the secretary of, of the Navy. He was from Florida and he would 
stay at his post as Secretary of the Navy for the entirety of the Confederacy's existence. Meanwhile, the, it was contrasted to the Secretary of War, which was always changing. Uh, people kept, uh, I think it had five different people, or maybe six. But you will see this politics of states' rights again pop up in the future. In after the firing of Fort Sumter by General Beauregard and Lincoln calling the seventy uh for seventy five thousand volunteer troops to put down the rebellion in the South, quote unquote rebellion. Uh, four states join, including. Uh, Virginia, North Carolina, Arkansas, and Tennessee. And the capital is moved from Montgomery, Alabama to Richmond, Virginia. And then, of course, what happens at the beginning of the war was this was putting, was scattering the defenses so that each of the seven states had some defense. And, you know, when you do that, it is have a more scattered approach, spread out approach, rather than a, rather than a concentrated approach. Uh, it's easy to break a point on the wall of the scattered approach compared to a concentrated approach. However, he did this because all seven states well, were considered uh, sovereign and independent, just as it was mentioned in the permanent Confederate Constitution, and even that principle was there in the Provisional Constitution. Davis did that for, you know, politics, obviously, balancing politics with trying to win. And, you know, he was selected unanimously by the delegates in both the Provisional and the Permanent Constitution. But not long after that, they would get angry. Now, uh, so there would be anti-Davis forces both, well, both in the Congress, in the Confederate Congress, as well as the press. And they would really not be happy about that. Now, we can talk about... Uh, the first Battle of Bull Run, or the first Manassas, which was the, the first battle of the war, in which Davis, well, the Confederates win, and Joe Johnston and Beauregard, I believe, had fought in that war. Now, after that, after the first battle, because they had won, it had felt they were they were engulfed in their own victory, but they should have pressed forward and, and took Washington, D.C. And I believe Beauregard had said that if he would give me 10,000 men, then... I can take Washington, D.C., but they didn't press on. And I think that was one of the major mistakes that Davis had, had made. He had not 
push forward after the victory at at Bull Run, the first but first Manassas. And what can I say? Not long after that, you would have the it would be clear who were the first the top five generals in the Confederate Army. At the top would be Samuel Cooper, who was actually born in New Jersey. He was, he, he never really fought. He, it was a desk job as adjutant general and inspector general. Next would be Albert Sidney Johnston, who, as you know, would, if you don't know, he dies in 1862, I believe. The, in, I, uh, it's on the tip of the, my tongue, but I don't remember. He he dies in the Shenandoah Valley, I believe, or he, he dies in the West fighting Ulysses Grant. And third would be Robert E. Lee, who was initially just going to be Davis's military advisor. Then fourth would be Joseph Johnston, and then fifth would be General Beauregard, P, uh, Pierre T. G. Beauregard, and those last two men were were not happy that three guys were outranked them who hadn't even fought yet. It's, um, it's, and well. The really the Congress chose them first. They chose it, made it that way, because that was how they would have been ranked in the Union Army. As in, Samuel Cooper was the highest ranking officer in the Union Army. If um, if you look at all the Confederates, um, and what else can I say? Joe Johnston was, I think, only a lieutenant colonel, while the other guys had that were colonels. the The top three guys were colonels in the Union Army, so that was how it went. And you know, it's he didn't uh, Jefferson Davis didn't just arbitrarily put sign that you no know, like choose them in that order. This was. What Congress saw, and then he signed it. But um, okay, um, but yeah, Robert E. Lee wasn't initially on, well, wasn't originally part of the the fighting force. But when Joe Johnston gets injured in eighteen sixty two, Robert E. Lee replaces him and. The army becomes known as the Army of Northern Virginia. And then, of course, Robert E. Lee is certainly more famous than Joe Johnston. Um, so there were a lot of details about the war and a lot of politics. One of the uh, I, I should say there were, there was a trifecta of Georgians who were very critical of Davis. That would be Joseph Brown, the governor of Georgia. Robert Toombs, who was initially the Secretary of War but resigned um, and became a general to, fu to fight, to actually fight. And Vice President Alexander H. Stevens. And they were very critical of him. Brown was often demanded for more more troops for for a defense of Georgia, but Davis had said, "If I give you more troops, they're all I have. Then I have to give every other state more troops to defend, and I can't do that and fight the war to win." Toombs was obviously. 
jealous. He was, you know, saw himself as a leader. If Davis was a leader among the Southern Democrats, Toombs was the leader of the Southern Whigs, although he his party history is a bit complicated. He founded the Constitutional Union Party, I think in 51, and left the Whigs. Well, he was along with Alexander H. Stevens. And then Toombs had joined the Democrats in 53. I, I could be wrong, but he joined before the Whigs disintegrated. And so um, Davis had always been a Democrat. So there were, certainly there is a, rival, a rivalry between the two of them. But Toombs was a leader of the Southern Whigs in Georgia. What else can I say? Stevens, in 1862, he goes back to his, his uh, home, in, I think in Crawford, Georgia, because he realizes that there's nothing for him to do there um, in Richmond. And often he would side with his governor on certain issues. Rather than the president of the United States, Jefferson Davis. And, you know, the governor was also not happy with conscription. Um, and a lot of, he got a lot of men exempted from the draft, which was not Davis's, hap it's not something Davis was happy with. And... You know, in the rise and fall of the Confederate government, Davis had said, there are two ways to, to get an army. Vo uh, volunteers and conscription. I, the Constitution gave me the power to raise an army. So, and it didn't, and so I, I could have done either way. Certainly, both the Union and the Confederacy had conscription although originally it was volunteers for both of them but they did draft young men and another thing is they both suspended habeas corpus civil liberties weren't exactly the greatest in either of them they they were both committed to winning the war, both Lincoln and Davis. But here's the difference when for that, for habeas corpus. L Lincoln did it unilaterally, while Davis did it through the Congress. He needed Congress, as in David, he needed Congress to, to, to pass it before he could sign it, sign the suspension of habeas corpus. And this is a, habeas corpus is a, a big thing it's not it's not just about following the constitution if you think about the anglo tradition it wasn't since the magna carta in 1215 in which king john had suspended the writ of habeas corpus in habe in the writ of in habeas the writ of habeas corpus ensures that you don't just get arrested for nothing and they don't the authorities don't tell you what you're arrested for, and then you stay in prison indefinitely. Because that's what King John, that's the type of thing King John would do. And that's the thing that, that Lincoln would do. Right? He suspended the writ of habeas corpus. Of course, the Congress follows up and does it afterwards. But the fact that he does it unilaterally and then Congress only, you know, catches up is that is not constitutional on on Lincoln's part and he should have been imp impeached for that. That's that's one of the the big things of the Lincoln's Lincoln critics from the time of the Copperheads all the way to today. That that is one of the chief, that's one of the things that they always bring up, and it is, it is valid to bring it up because it's not 
because that is violating his oath. Um, but, um, let's, uh, let's talk about, uh, something else. I think his, uh, about more of the war. Davis had Davis to sorry <laughs> later Joe Johnson recovers and he's put in command of an army and originally he was there defending Atlanta and he gets replaced by General Hood and it's because and I think it's because Davis wanted wanted Joe Johnson to fight uh, Sherman's army, William Tecumseh Sherman's army. And he was, you know, more, more uh, hesitant to do that. More careful with men's lives, you could say. But, uh, he, but Davis replaces him with Hood, General Hood, and Hood charges at Sherman's army three times and loses all three times, uh, loses badly all three times. So then when, before the election of 1864 and the, the, for the presidential election, Davis, oh uh, no, sorry. Sherman destroys Atlanta and at the defeat at of Atlanta is uh, squarely placed at the hands of at the feet of Jefferson Davis uh, the Congress the Confederate Congress and the press the anti Davis press were really really not happy with with that one if he had not replaced Hood. Not, uh, they, uh, if he had not replaced Joe Johnson with Hood, and then Joe Joe Johnson would never have done those three charges that would that whittled down his own army would have whittled down his own army, and then Atlanta would not have been captured at that time. Would not have been. Uh, and that would. Because the ca the the sacking of Atlanta was was uh, one of the big you could say factors in the Republicans winning winning the eighteen sixty four election. Obviously, it's not just the only factor. Certainly, there was voter fraud. Um, that the Union Army was guilty of, <laughs> but. That was one of the big things. But even before the election, Davis was was not putting his hopes on a Democrat winning on on the Democrats winning the, the election. He was focused on winning the war. Or you could say also trying to get uh England and France to recognize the Confederacy. He actually sent one person way too late to, to go to England and, and France. In France, uh, I don't even remember his name. This is some secret mission that Congress didn't, the Confederate Congress did not know about. In France, and he told him, he told the secret mission guy, um, he would. Uh, he was willing to put abolition on the table because um, independence mattered more than slavery to to Jefferson Davis, and I, I'm glad that at least James McPherson pointed that out that Jefferson Davis valued independence over slavery, um, and for for that mission. He went to France to meet Napoleon the Third, and he said 
basically he would do that if if Britain would do that, but so he had met with Lord Palmerston, the the Prime Minister of Great Britain, and and he did have some sympathy towards the the South, but there's no way that Queen Elizabeth would have supported it, and well, maybe maybe it's not just that he also was wouldn't have done that either, and I'm not sure if William. Well, I'm not sure if Lord John Russell would have. And some people think if if Gladstone was Prime Minister, he would have. Gladstone became Prime Minister in, six, in 1866, one year after... Oh, 1866? No, he... 1868, he became Prime Minister. This is one year after... After um, the, sorry, three years after the the end of the war, because this is how it was for the for the entirety of the war, Lord Palmerston was the president, no, was the prime minister of Great Britain. But, so, the surrender at Appomattox happened that April. Palmer Palmerston dies in August, and he is succeeded by. Lord John Russell, who loses the election of 66 to the, the Conservative Party. And then two years later, in 68, or, or uh, he, uh, it is William Gladstone who becomes the leader of the Liberal Party, which was what, which was the party of Lord Palmerston and Lord John Russell, and uh, yeah, that um, during during the war though, when he was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, William Gladstone had given a speech, which you could say was sort of sympathetic to to the South. He had said that Jefferson Davis had created a nation. The, the the South had an, an army and a navy and a, a government, and he said that Jefferson Davis had created a nation, even though maybe that's not exactly what happened. <laughs> he wasn't the one who draft who helped draft the Constitution, the Provisional or the Permanent Constitution. He was he was the one who was chosen to be president, which was different, and he he certainly was not pushing for secession of Mississippi when he was the senator of Mississippi, the United States senator from Mississippi. He was not trying to undermine the, the institution of the United States federal government. Um, in, back, in, back in that time. So I wouldn't say he helped, he, he created the, the nation, <laughs> certainly. And there's also, you know, a problem with the word of nation was, was um, the provisional and the permanent constitutions of the Confederate government were more decentralist than than uh, the United States Constitution, and the United States Constitution is not supposed to establish a nation. It's supposed to establish a federal republic, but uh. Yeah, I'm... Where was I going with this? What's one more thing I can say about Davis? So... Uh, I already forgot, I'm sorry. McPherson, you know, concludes the book by saying... If... That it may not have mattered... Who the South have, would have chosen to be president, because... Uh, they were outnumbered. There's no way. Is there anyone who would have won? Had uh, how uh, there were a lot of mistakes, sure that Davis made, but would would there have been anyone better and who would have made 
less mistakes you you wouldn't really know that and um the south was outnumbered it was unless unless they had won gettysburg or vicksburg in 1863 or if atlanta hadn't shown hadn't fallen or something if something or if they had taken washington dc there there are so many what if scenarios you don't know if you don't really know if there was anyone better and to for for than jefferson davis at the time he did he did his best he did what as someone who had both political and military experience he did his best to in the situation he was given and the and he was elected unanimously by the delegates so there it's not like they knew they had someone else the south knew someone else in mind that they could just pick for president and but and like his relationship with the generals particularly joe johnston and general beauregard those two generals who really did not have um a good relationship with him and his enemies uh Je jefferson davis's enemies in the confederate congress were you know sympathetic with those two generals but um uh he fought for independence okay one last thing the hampton roads conference which he sends alexander h stevens and two other high-ranking members of congress to what to join uh to negotiate peace and he they and he told them um that they should have uh they should they they cannot compromise on independence and lincoln and i think seward was with him when well, a first uh first they met through general grant but then afterwards um the three delegates met with lincoln and i think seward or one other member of his cabinet and Lincoln said, if you get back in the Union right now, you can vote down the 13th Amendment and you can have slavery until the 20th century, until 1900. And then uh, by the way, um, Brazil had slavery until the 1880s. So, I mean, if you look back at it, Lincoln was promising them to have, sla to have slavery for longer than what Brazil would end up having, having slavery for. But I mean, that's just looking back. Like you wouldn't know how long Brazil would have slavery. And certainly there were some ex-Confederates who, who escaped to Brazil and they were called Confederados, but I, I didn't really do much research on that. Uh, the book doesn't really talk about this. And it really didn't bring that up either, how Lincoln had promised had said they could vote down the 13th amendment if if the confederate states got back into the union and uh jefferson davis told told stevens he cannot compromise on on independence and certainly stevens was tempted to take up lincoln on his offer he was friends with lincoln in the Congress, in the Congress from 47 to 49. Uh, the, the, this was back when James Polk was the president and, and uh, the Whigs were against the Mexican, the Mexican American war. But Um, there's certainly, uh, Lincoln had a plan for reconstruction, like after the war, he would, 
you would be more tolerant than than you know the radical republicans were were more we would be less hard on the south and he would want an alliance with the southern whigs who were many of whom uh, the former southern whigs who were many of whom were not were that thrilled about secession um not really that strong on states rights um people like alexander h stevens who at georgia secession convention had voted against secession and in his speech he said that slavery was better protected in the union because if they leave the union and then they're defeated in war by the north they don't get to keep slavery <laughs> and stevens was right but uh he so he was certainly tempted to keep not to to do that but he to take lincoln up on his offer but davis had told him they need independence was first he cannot compromise on independence and uh james mcpherson doesn't really talk doesn't talk about this and i don't know like i don't want to say it's because he's a union man he's a mainstream northern historian but that's though, though unfortunately that's what i was thinking so um before i get into Canadian politics, let's just say that uh, Lincoln, well, that he, uh, McPherson didn't think that Davis was that awful, and he, he did what he had to do for independence. That's it. And well, I mean, he, he, sure, he made mistakes, but who wouldn't? Is there anyone else? better than davis and there's no there was no clear answer for that there was, who would who would have known someone who was better than davis he was the most popular man for the job and that's that was what people picked him for even though later there would be some some uh, opposition to davis in the confederate congress and in the press now let's talk about today's today's politics uh canadian politics um so right now there are two leadership races for the conservatives for conservatives well conservative leadership races one in alberta due to jason kenny resigning as the leader well he he's still governing as premier but eventually he he will have to step aside for whoever's support whoever wins the ucp leadership race and you know it's really funny most uh most of the the leadership candidates um i don't know some of them yeah uh, one of the big things is albert the alberta sovereignty act in as being debated daniel smith who maybe considered a front runner in the race is really pushing for this thing known as the Alberta Sovereignty Act, which would essentially resist and nullify federal actions deemed to be against the interest of the federal, well, against in Alberta's interest. Now, you know, initially I was happy about this one. You know, it it sounds like the principles of 1798, but this is just Alberta's interest, not necessarily constitutional. This is not this is not necessarily what how do you say this? Anything that the federal government does that is unconstitutional. It's just Alberta's interest. And um, there are some th key things to consider 
in for differences between the states and Quebec and Canada. In the states, each state is considered free, sovereign, and independent. While in 1867, that's not exactly what each province was. Supposedly, the federal government is supreme, more supreme, even though I would say in certain areas, Canada is more decentralist, particularly on education. Although there was this, you could say this left wing anti hate plat, uh, anti hate um, pamphlet being spread around in schools created by the federal government. But traditionally, edu the realm of education, as um, described in section 93 of the Constitution Act, 1867. Uh, traditionally, the education was exclusively provincial, and that's something that I like. It's the it's one it's the one of the big things in the differences between Canada and the United States. It is more separate. Uh, it there is certainly more of a separation. Well, you see in in the United States that there's a lot of federal regulation of of schools and there's even a department of education funny thing is ronald reagan promised that he would scrap it and the federal uh, the department of education and he didn't he lowered the funding but it wasn't scrapped to this day it still exists and but the federal the, the department of education is unconstitutional and at least we don't have that in the Canadian federal government. But going back to the Sovereignty Act, um, well, well, I guess one more thing, one more difference is that the provinces aren't technically equal because they're not, as they're not free, sovereign, and independent, and they're also, they also did not join Canada equally. There's some statutes that were put in when they joined the Confederation. Um, I guess one thing to note is that Alberta and Saskatchewan used to be together in this territory known as Buffalo, and then they were got they got split. This is back in nineteen o five, when Wilfrid Laurier was the president was the prime minister, and I don't know if that necessarily cuts their power, or but um, if you look at but Alberta and Saskatchewan. Alberta, there is, there is a lot more separatist sentiment. I think I was watching a, an interview with Maxime Bernier, and he was saying that I think there were more, there were a little more, it's, it's all in the 30s, but there were proportionally, there were more Albertans who wanted separation than Quebecers, but it's still both in the 30s. And then even in Ontario, there are people who want se separation, but it's lower. And hmm. remember one more thing. There were, uh, there was a, there was a referendum on equalization and, and Alberta voted to and equalization, even though uh, a province can't just do that. It has to go through the constitution. Um, so, but the Alberta Sovereignty Act, by uh, in the name, it uses the word sovereignty. And obviously the leftists who, uh, who love centralization in Canada, they obviously were against it. And hmm. I remember <laughs> reading about there's this one far left professor at Waterloo, Emmett McFarlane, who I remember he his tweet got blown up when Brett Kavanaugh was confirmed. He said burn down the Supreme Court and then afterwards he locked his Twitter account. <laughs> and and this guy, he's saying yeah, but the Alberta Sovereignty Act would be unconstitutional, but 
Of course he would say that. And the thing is, it's not like Alberta or like Alberta wants the same powers that Quebec has at, at the very least. And during the set, and there, there was certainly, you know, nullification going on in BC when it comes to marijuana before marijuana was legalized or in Quebec in the 70s when it came to abortion. Um, this is before the Morgan Teller case in 88, which struck down the abortion law so that there were no abortion laws until up until this day. And, you know, it's so funny how... Um, How uh, some of them, some of the leadership candidates are trying to, in, in the Alberta's race, are trying to sidestep the abortion issue. Because after Roe v. Wade fell, Rachel Notley demanded from the leadership candidates essentially where their stance was on abortion. And some of them said that they were pro choice, while others were like Brian Jean. He, I think he used he many years ago he used to identify as pro life. Now or not he doesn't really identify as a social conservative. And Brian Jean tried to when he was asked. I think he sort of sidestepped the issue by saying, "Abortion really is federal jurisdiction." And Notley was trying to divide Albertans, or he did not want to divide Albertans on this issue. And then. I forgot, I was reading on, it was CTV Edmonton's um, website. Uh, there was another guy who identified as pro-life, but he said he would not do anything. So <laughs> you could see, oh, uh, I guess Danielle Smith, uh, she said she's pro-choice, but not just on abortion, but certainly on all medical decisions, including vaccines, which I guess that, I, that's an understandable position, and it's certainly better than Rachel Notley's position, or the the far left's position, which would be to pro choice on abortion, but not on vaccines. So, um, Smith shows herself. Well, I think she's trying to show herself as consistent. Although I do <laughs> some some people like in the first UCP leadership race. Uh, uh, debate, which I didn't really watch, but there was a clip uh, saying that, uh, showing and on Twitter that I watched, and one guy said, Danielle Smith has crossed the floor, in which Smith talks about her, about how they can reach net zero through the private sector, but um, this lip service to net zero is really <laughs> it's really it's not good and some people are really not liking that like i can understand i can sort of sympathize with it with the free market the not government approach but the lip service for net zero is some people really don't like that and it's can she rec regain the trust because if you don't know anything about smith she was the she was the leader of the opposition from 2012 to 2015. Not 2014, I think. She crossed the floor. She was, she was the leader of the Wild Rose Party because back then the PCs were in power. And then she crossed the floor along with six other MLAs. And um, that just, that, that, her crossing the floor helped helped uh, destroy, well, I mean, really destroy, not just, well, it, it, it led to the NDPs winning. Um, as in, back then, it was the uh, Rachel Notley, who was the leader of the NDP, hadn't fully consolidated the vote. But then afterwards, the, the left-wing vote, because... The liberals were still the Alberta liberals were still still had a couple seats I think 
But then, but now she has fully consolidated the left wing vote. How it works in Alberta is that now is that she has a that Rachel Notley's NDP has an iron grip over Edmonton. There's only one MLA from Edmonton, Casey Madu. He's the he was the justice minister. And then Edmonton plus Calgary make up a little over 50% of the seats. So the city folk have the potential to outvote the rural folk. Just those two cities. And if and if Notley wins, like if, if she's able to win enough Calgary seats, like to win Calgary or enough Calgary plus some small, some of the surrounding area, some suburban areas, then she wins, then she gets to become pre premier for a second time and the NDP gets back into power. But um, we'll see which type of of uh, leader leader they they choose. Well, the Alberta Conservatives choose because what I this is about fighting for like the soul of you know sovereignty. Like Alberta, the Alberta Sovereignty Act is a really big issue in Alberta politics now. And some some of the leadership candidates do support it, while others don't. And I like that 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 is one of the main issues. But um, the other issue is um, that like the when it comes to abortion, like okay, if you talking about abortion, there are three abortion clinics in Alberta, one in Edmonton, two in Calgary. Now, um, and obviously they're. Funded by the province because even though crime is federal jurisdiction, um, the healthcare is supposedly uh, a provincial jurisdiction, even though uh, the federal government funds helps fund these the healthcare systems. So, um I don't know, I get this feeling. You get, you have in Canada, you know, as my, Michael Malice would say, conservatism is progressivism driving the speed limit. It's as if most of these, if not all of these Albertans, Albertan leadership people, they, 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 they aren't pro-life or they don't have a pro-life agenda. And that leads me to this uh, the Conservative Party of Canada's leadership race. There's only currently one who one leadership candidate who's who identifies as pro life. That would be Leslie Lewis. Now, Roman Baber, who is not a social conservative, he would be okay with a free vote on abortion, but the other three candidates in the race are resolutely pro-choice. That would be Scott Aitchison, Jean Charest, and Pierre Polyev. And, uh, you know, Polyev, I, I really dislike him. He's the most popular one. And, I mean, I, do, I dislike Jean Charest even more, but Polyev is a career politician, even more so than Jean Charest. I mean, Charest at least work had some private sector experience. Now, I don't like that private sector experience either. It was working with Huawei, who, as you know, is a Chinese uh, telecom company. They make phone. <laughs> they make phones, right? Right, and um, what else? And but people think that. Huawei would spy on Canada and other countries. Um, China would spy through Huawei. And another thing to mention would be um, 
I guess Jean Charest is also like he also embodies that uh, I that mentality of conservatism is progressivism driving the speed limit because in nineteen ninety he actually did vote for the uh, the abortion bill, which would have there would be a restriction on abortion. It died in the Senate due to like it was a tie vote. And because it taught, and the Speaker of the House, he, because it was a tie, it wasn't because he's, he was necessarily, no, the Speaker of the Senate, he, it wasn't because he was necessarily for or against the bill, but because it was a tie, he, he voted down, he had, he believed he had to vote down the bill, the, uh, in the Senate. And people are saying that's the reason why Canada has no abortion law. Well, as in, the reason why it failed in the Senate, they're saying, is because they're, because both pro-choicers and resolute pro-lifers weren't, weren't willing to compromise. What? And, of course, the pro-choice people won out in the end. And the pro-life people at that time, they were saying that those who voted, those who, who voted for it would go to hell, basically, because allowing for a compromise on life. But there's, there's a problem with all of that. The Senate doesn't answer to the voters. It's so dumb. Some people think that it's because of that. No, it's, it's because... It's because the Senate doesn't answer to anyone. They're there until they're 75 and they get, they can be expelled from caucus or whatever, but they're there for life. Well, until 75. And, on, well, I guess if, I guess the, the whole Senate can expel a certain member for, some, for something doing, if, if, if he or she had done something egregious, but no, the the issue is how the Senate works. That's me. If you have a pro pro life bill passed through the House of Commons today, I'm gonna tell you it's the Senate that's gonna block it. Okay, and this isn't. It's it's dumb, and we. Some people like some pro lifers think. That it's it's because of the unwillingness to compromise at, at, in 1990 at that time that there wouldn't have been there would have been some abortion law and there isn't and it's it's because no it's because of the Senate and now. What I like about Roman Baber is that uh, he he did say he's going to end equalization without having to change the constitution. <laughs> to change the Senate, you need to change the constitution. But for equalization, what I like is he he consistently says he is against socialism. He's not well. He's he and he believes in free markets. He. He not only is against um, supply management, which was a policy started by Justin Trudeau's father back in seventy one. Well, it came into effect seventy two. It was I think it was passed by in by the Liberal government in seventy one, but really came into effect seventy two. But there's also um, there's also uh, and unfortunately, like, yeah, that is also the whole, as Michael Malice would say, conservatism is progressivism driving the speed limit. The modern conservative party now embraces this Trudeau policy, just like they embrace <laughs> his, uh, uh, just, uh, Pierre Trudeau's multiculturalism. Although this conservative party wasn't the first conservative party. The, the PCs under Brian Mulroney had a, 
conservative had a multiculturalism act back in 1988 but you see a pattern here and then now for abortion most of the leadership candidates still remaining patrick brown the mayor of brampton who was actually disqualified and this um i can talk i can talk about that for a long time but then this podcast is going to go for much longer than i want but unfortunately this is what we're given and i really do like maxine bernier um policy certainly he had said it's not just being against supply management it's also having being open to debate on abortion which i like um <laughs> i was i was in brampton a couple of days ago and told to listen to roman baber and uh we talked a little bit i just asked him about his view on china and then he said like yeah he he does not like communism and china has locked down tens of millions of healthy people it's, you know that's a good example I, I should have talked to him more about taiwan so, um because you know as you know nancy pelosi has come to taiwan now what what are the reasons um who knows i mean i won't get into that um but um what can i say um to, uh, today is august 3rd is uh the the debate between uh the <laughs> it's really three people three person debate Jean Charest, Roman Baber and Scott Aitchison and uh Leslie Lewis and Pierre Polyev canceled well Pierre Polyev was uh he refused to go I think he has nothing to gain from it and I think it can only hurt him if he has another as a third debate well as Lewis well she I don't know she she demanded first to to have certain questions addressed and they didn't address them so I don't know um and so uh, and I don't know she focused on just campaigning across the country and then finally I, sh I should say that Kong um it showed that uh recently the donor donor donors were donor information was released for the second quarter and Pierre Polyev is miles ahead of everyone uh Jean Chere is a distant second place when it comes to number of nine comes to amount of money raised while well, Leslie Lewis has more donors but you know Aitchison and Baber at the bottom uh Aitchison's at the very bottom and then Baber is just behind Charé when it comes to number of voters I think um Aitchison is also ace, ace at the very bottom when it comes to amount of money raised I don't remember the, the, the numbers but yeah, um, this, this podcast is getting a little longer. Um, and I know the title is Jefferson Davis. But um, I wasn't getting... I hope to see if if Baber wins, who certainly... I like his... I like a lot of his policies, even though I de identify as pro-life and Leslie Lewis is pro-life. Certainly, Baber winning would would also be you know good <laughs> he was saying don't vote for the ppc please we cannot afford more justin trudeau we cannot afford a vote split and well we'll see we'll see um if Share wins and he's gonna drive more people to the ppc so we'll we'll, we'll see i like the ppc's views on decentralization as well um then that, there's a, the, the one of the big differences between Baber and really every uh and between Maxine Bernier and Baber well Baber plus all of the other candidates was that they were against these uh discriminatory laws of 
religious symbols in Quebec, while as Bernier keeps saying, I respect provincial jurisdiction. So uh, certainly Bernier is much more decentralist on this. But um, yeah, I'm th I think I'm going to end it there. I th I'm sorry I ranted for quite a while. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe. Um, some people, like, I get to their comments really late. Like, there are a couple of people who've commented. Um, I'll comment more. I'll, I'll try to... I know, I'm sorry if I respond to your comment really late. but uh, Or sometimes I don't even respond. I just press the like. I like your comment and you don't get the notification. But that's that's okay. Um, I'm glad that some people are watching, even though not many people are. And thank you for, I think there are more people who listen on Anchor.fm or wherever podcasts get distributed. So thank you for that. Um, this has been Canadian Meets the South, episode 15. And uh, I hope to talk to you more later. Thank you.